Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Janelle Zenzin, and we have um, Carolyn Hoffman here too, and we'll intro in a second. But this is the week three of the R for HMIS admins um, training series. And uh, we're coming at you from Baton Rouge today. Well, I am. I'm here for uh, taking care of family. Um, but anyway, so uh, again, I'm Janelle Denzen. I work at Cohio as the HMIS data analyst. I also helped to organize the Columbus Our Ladies. And Carolyn, you want to intro yourself? Sure. Are you? Are we not doing camera? I'll just share my webcam. Oh yeah, no, let's do it. Yeah. Just like, do it. like if we're at a conference or something. Um, I'm Carolyn. Oh, She's, she's gotten me into all kinds of coding uh, workshops and it's been really fun to kind of work under her wing. Um, I'll share something in the chat that I worked on. It's like the smallest little project, but um, we had to fill in some gaps with the pit app that we bought. So that was a quick map that we threw together to help folks understand our sampling system in Ohio um, and what census tracts uh, regions we were going to um, be sampling in. So. It was like a quick thing, free to do an R, and we were able to kind of fill in um, where our vendor did not provide that map. All right, I'll turn my screen off now. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess I will too. Um, but yeah, we we uh, both use R in our work at Ohio, and um, we, as such, we've been using GitHub, and we're going to talk about that today. So this is, um, like, I, like I said, week three, we're gonna be talking about version control and um, we're gonna be using Git for that. Um, and I guess I would want to hear from folks on the call if they had any feedback on the homework, if you had any trouble installing it, if, um, you got your login for GitHub, if you had any questions about the export, anything from the homework from last time. And I'll just wait for a little bit. So uh, I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that if I'm not hearing that there were problems that everything went fine um, and you all have Git installed on your computers. Um, so if that's not true, go ahead and put it in the, in the uh, questions and we'll, we'll get to that as, as if that's a problem. Uh. Okay, so um, just like in prior, um, in prior, Weeks sessions, um, having access to two monitors will be ideal, uh, but not a deal breaker. And again, you can send questions and comments to the chat. And um, this is the, the link to where all the resources and recordings and homework instructions, um, where you can find all that. Um, and you're, yeah, at the end of this presentation, you're actually gonna have this, um, available to you on your computer, if, if all goes well. I see there was a question. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So what is version control? So in week two, we, if you remember, there was a slide where we talked about um, why we love code. And um, these are the three reasons here. The third one uh, being diffable, and uh, which means that you can compare changes over time. And uh, so, and I, you know, I kind of alluded to the fact that we were really going to cover that one um, in this week, um, this week's session. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so as we iterate our code. Um, a version control system makes it easy to create snapshots of our work and make a note for each one that we create to explain the reasoning. So if you think about 
if, if you'd relate it to something that oh, most people have some experience with um, in our line of work, it would be very akin to the, um, word track changes in Word, um, where you can suggest a change, see what this suggested change is, and reject or accept it, um, and then suppose you could add notes too. Um, but so it's, it's somewhat different, but it's, it's very much the same um, idea. Um, so having this kind of system for working on code allows multiple developers to work together at the same time um, on the same code and where it allows you to like merge changes and resolve conflicts um, uh, in a pretty graceful way. So like that's, that's great and all, but um, how, you know, how does this apply to HMIS admins? So some of the things that I've seen um, is that, so a lot of us have reports that are written or a report that really is more of a process because of where it comes from and then where it um, sort of gets changed and then where it gets visualized. Um, and so these things, we're already kind of documenting these things um, in kind of analog ways. Like I've seen uh, spreadsheets that are shared between uh, HMIS admins that you know lay out the code for every single variable in a report, and then you know which variables are used in what cells, and like then you got to talk about you know things like um, alerters and where the data is coming from and um, all of these things um, have to be documented somehow because as we all know we can lose these reports through no fault of our own um, because of decisions made um, upstream that we have nothing to do with um, so this is this is like a main reason i feel that we need it um, another good like use of it is the um, like when things happen to what we're supposed to be collecting. So if the, the HUD data standards change um, and we kind of need to make a new version of a report before we're actually using it, um, that is another way that the version control system really helps us to um, work on a, a, a version of the code without actually you know, affecting what's showing up for the user at the time. Um, it also helps with working, you know, like I mentioned in the, in the other slide, um, working with other data analysts on the same code. If you're lucky enough to work in a place where you um, have someone else that's coding, then that's great. It really helps with that. But if you're working alone um, and you have like more than one computer, um, I used to use it a lot. Actually, I still do. But um, I used to use a lot when I, I worked in the in an office before <laughs> before the pandemic, and um, I would make code changes all day, push the code changes, come home, open up my laptop, pull the changes, and then I can start from where I left off. Um, and it's very easy and seamless to do that. So and we'll show you how that works. Uh, so what is Git? It's, it's a free and open source version control system. Uh, since it is installed on your computer, you can type git commands into your command prompt or your terminal, however you call that, and um, your computer will understand that. And a note here is um, I am not an expert in Git, <laughs> and I use it all the time. So I'm, I'm an expert in Git in the way that I use it on a regular basis. But there are things that come along where I'm like, well, I want to do this slightly different thing. And so I need to kind of like look into how to do that. Um, and like, I know Carolyn has a lot of experience with Git, and um, I know some other folks that are pretty good, <laughs> pretty good with it. So, um, anyway, we're going to be aiming uh, to, to do some very basic ways of using Git today. Um, and so that's what we're going to work on today. Do you have anything to add to that, Carolyn? No. 
Okay. So what is GitHub? Um, so GitHub is just one way of using Git. You could also use GitLab or Bitbucket or any number of other ones. Um, GitHub is owned by Microsoft um, and it's the most popular way to use Git. So, um, and I, that's what I use and that's, that's what I'm gonna be teaching um, just because I know it, um, but you're welcome to choose whatever platform you want. And so before we get into the demo part of this, I just wanted to go over some vocabulary that's gonna be thrown around while we're doing things in the demo. Um, so that when you see these words, they don't um, jar you <laughs> um, and you've kind of heard them before and so you already kind of know what they mean. Um, so I'm gonna try to describe them and if you, you know, it, you'll, I think you'll, once you see it in action, it will make more sense. Um, but so anyway, uh, repository, in terms of, if you're thinking about what a repository is, in terms of using it with our studio, it, I, I equate it with a project in our studio. So you, you would keep like similar things together inside of a repository. Um, anything that you would wanna share as a sort of complete code base, you might wanna put all in one repository. There's a lot of you know ideas out there about how to decide what to put in a repository. You just throw everything into one, do you divide it up a lot? Um, but in general, you think of it like a project I do in our, our studio. And so uh, branch is like, so I was describing before how sometimes when like the, the HUD data standards change say, and you have some reports that you're using uh, that look at the, the way the data standards were prior to the change, and you still need that, because you're still using those reports, but you're working on um, some changes to that code and you're not done making all those changes yet that have to do with that particular HUD data standards change. Um, so this is, these would be called branches. So the one branch you would have, and that is the one that, you know, the, the code base that's being used right now. And then you would have what's called a feature branch and that's where you're working on a large-ish kind of change to that code, which would then um, eventually, once you like it and you want to make it, you know, the, the code that gets used, you would merge the, those branches and then you would have all those changes into your, your main code. So we just covered merge. <laughs> um, so then uh, remote versus local, um, that is from your point of view. So if you're, if you're saying the remote branch, that means the, the branch that is on GitHub or if you're using GitLab on GitLab. Um, and local means your laptop or your desktop um, or wh whatever it is that you're, you've got your hands on the keyboard, that, that machine. That's local, um, and you'll that'll make sense more sense as we get into that. Um, so as you're making changes to code throughout the day, um, some of the things that you do to take those those snapshots that I was talking about before of each iteration of your code is basically. Um, you would stage it and then uh, do a commit message and then you would commit it. Um, and that is sort of creates a snapshot on your local computer. And then sort of at the end of the day or a couple of times a day, if you're doing a lot that day, um, you would then push all of the commits that you've been doing to the remote branch. So that would be to like GitHub or to GitLab or whatever it is. Um, and then you go home from work and you haven't had enough yet. So you get on your laptop and you pull all of those commits that you had done during the day. And now you have the most recent code. So 
So those are just um, some definitions for you so that when we come across these words, um, you'll already kind of have an idea. Is there anything I, sh I should cover, uh, Carolyn, before I move on to the demo? I think, I think you covered it. I, I want to just say that uh, it took me a while to remember to pull every time I started coding. I would kind of open it mm. just because I'm used to like Microsoft Word or PowerPoint. Yeah. Wherever it was saved is kind of where you pick up again, but that's not really how it works, especially if you're working on a project with several people or working on it like you in an office and then on a laptop. Um, so it took me a while to remember to always start by pulling down uh, the most recent version. That is a good point. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, we're gonna start the demo and I, I put that link there because I'm expecting that maybe like and this might be a wrong guess but i'm expecting that some of you didn't want to use github or you had you already have an account with with like gitlab or maybe bitbucket or something like this um and as i said i'm going to be training on this as if it's github and you're going to be seeing github everywhere um so if you're needing like extra instructions this is a wonderful site written by a um, R Studio user who um, who just wrote out all of these instructions for people who are trying to get GitHub to work uh, seamlessly with R Studio, which it does naturally anyway, um, generally, but anyway, th so this is a, a really good resource and if you're having trouble and I can't answer you, um and carolyn can't answer you at the time this is where i would recommend coming um and if you know if you had any any trouble installing git you can come here um anyway there's a lot there's a lot here and so i just wanted to take the time to um to recommend this before we get started the link is in the chat thanks Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is um, go to GitHub or whatever your chosen platform is and log in. Uh, I'm already logged in, dang it. And we are going to create a new repo. So um, whatever platform you're on, uh, go ahead and click new or new, new repository, whatever it is. And so just, I'm going to name mine test, test, and I'm going to keep it private because I'm just going to delete it and eventually anyway. And I'm going to click and in that initialize this repository with a readme. Um, but you wouldn't have to, but we're, we're going to be doing that. So then click create repository. And you'll notice that you, you now are in a new repository with your um, username right here and your new repository is is any is anybody need like support you are all doing okay <laughs> put a put a question in if you're lost um so um yeah okay i should have said this before i did create but it there were two other um things that I didn't talk about. One was uh, it gave you the chance to add a .git ignore file. And the other one is it gave you a chance to add licensing um, to your repository. And you can do both of those things after the fact. So that's why I didn't uh, select them. Um, but you'll, you'll see what I'm saying soon. So what we're going to do now is go to clone. 
and then click the clipboard. And now you have this link on your clipboard. And then go to our studio. And then file, new project. And if you remember last week when we created a project, we went new directory and we did like a practice project. Um, so this week, what we're gonna do is version control and it gives you two choices and we are using Git. So we're gonna go ahead and click Git and then paste that link into your URL field there. And you wanna leave the directory name the same to match the name of your repository. And then uh, make sure like, like last week, make sure that you are creating the project as a subdirectory of R. If you need to do browse and go find your R directory, you can do that. And I, you don't need to do this, but I am going to because I need to keep this uh, project open, the R training project, because it's running my slides and I need those again. Um, but I'm gonna check this, but you don't have to, but you can if you want. So then you're gonna cl click uh, create project and it says cloning into test. And then it opened another project. And here it is. So this is the readme that is here. When you, um, when you created your repo, you initialized with a readme. And you'll notice that there are two other files here. One is test.rproj, which you might recognize from last week. Um, because anytime you create an R project in an, in our studio, it automatically creates this .rproj file um, at the root of the project. Um, and so that is just something that R Studio added for you. And then it also added a .git ignore file. And that is also something that was added by R Studio because it noticed you didn't have one. So let's open that file and see what's in it. So our studio created this and it says that these are the thing, these are the files they're assuming that we don't want to be, you know, maintained on GitHub. And uh, so that's fine. Like, I think this is all accurate. Um, so we don't really need to change any of that. So um, I just want to check in with folks. Does everyone have a Git tab right here in their R Studio? Thanks, Zach, for saying yes. <laughs> oh, Tina you. does not. No. Hmm. Okay. So we have one no. Oh. I wonder why it's still cloning. Did you create? Well. Um, okay. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. All right. Well, um, so well, if you if you are create if you create a um a repository on you know GitHub or GitLab or whatever, and then create a project with it, you should have a Git tab. However, if you notice, uh, in this Happy Git with R. Um, there's a whole chapter dedicated to detect Git with, from our studio, and it um, it has like things to check 
and you know how to sort of troubleshoot that. So I would recommend um, if you want to troubleshoot it now, but uh, you would probably do better to just like wait until the you know the end and then let me know if you you know start troubleshooting it after. Um, and we'll just keep going through the steps here. Um, okay, so like I pointed out, um, Git Ignore has you know four sort of default things that come into that file that our studio assumes you don't want tracked by Git. So if you look in the Git tab, you'll see that it Git has noticed a couple of files that are either different or new compared to what's on the remote brand, uh, the remote repository called test um, which according to that to the remote it, there's just a readme here so on your local though it has two more files so it gets like i see two files that are not on the other one um, and so this test.rproj, I figured out after a long time, you don't need to have that update on Git. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select test.rproj and go to more and then click ignore. So all of these things I'm doing uh, by clicking menus and buttons um, are generally otherwise done by writing git commands in the terminal and i'll show you that in a second but first we're gonna we're gonna just do it the clicking way and then i'll sort of show you um a little bit about the terminal part of it um but so you can see here this the this file name has been added to git ignore and it's saying like is this what you want is this what you meant um and so it is so i'm going to click save and now you see it disappeared from the Git tab because it's no longer, Git does not care about it anymore because it's in the Git ignore file. So another thing you can do from here, well, I was just gonna show you. The terminal is where you can, you can, um, you can type in uh, Git commands. And by the way, what I've been working on um, separately from all of this, is how to change your master branch to be named main branch because I just personally don't uh, like the tone of that word, the master branch. Um, and if you notice here, we are on the master branch, even though we did not tell Git what to name our main branch. It just named it master because that's the default. Um, and so I wanted to like go in and change all that, try to work out how to get it you know, into the process we're doing, but it just was too complicated. So, um, but anyway, you can see where these are some some commands that um, we we use. So if I do git branch, it notices that I have one branch and that's master. So anyway, that's how that works. I usually never need to do that. So, um, but anyway, if I wanna see, um, if I want to commit this file, so I want this git ignore file to come to be out and part of this repo on the on the remote. So what I would do is um, click the staged thing here and um, commit. Yeah, this will definitely be recorded um, and and put up on the on the site. So yeah, you're, you're like, feel free to just like relax and just watch what I'm doing if you're not able to follow along because of a problem. The uh, the recording question I answered with a link, it's also in the chat uh, where it says oh. homework down here. That's where we're posting the recording. Nice, thanks. Okay, so um, I have staged but not committed this um, new file um, that that we've added to the local branch. So it's saying this is what's changed because nothing existed prior to that. So I'm just gonna write the commit message of initial commit, and then I'm gonna click commit, 
And so you can see like that it's sending a, um, a git command here to do all that. And then it gives you your comment. And then it says one file changed five insertions because there were five lines here and they were green. So that's what it's counting. Um, and so now it says your branch is ahead of origin slash master by one commit. So at this time when you're working, let's say like you're creating new scripts or you're modifying scripts or whatever, um, you can keep racking up the commits and then um, at the end of the day or however often um, you would push. And so like, well, first before we push, I just want to just to demonstrate that this repo, that which is the remote, still just has the readme. It doesn't know anything about that git ignore file that we've created. So we're going to push now. And it's going to go out to the remote branch. And now if I re refresh, it has that git ignore file. And you can see that comment. And it'll tell you how long ago. How's everyone doing? I don't see any questions. Um, I okay. thought I thought the example it might be helpful to use that um, icon, the new folder icon, and maybe uh, make a data folder because. I think that helps to understand how git ignore works. And we could also do a commit message that like describes um, what's in that commit, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to do, yeah. Um, what was I planning? That's coming oh, yeah. in. I'm actually going to have us create a script. And I think, yeah, let's create a new folder uh, called data, like Carolyn said. And then, um, create a new script and we can just type you just like type whatever in here um mt cars i always say that and then out loud and it sounds like you're saying mt cars like that <laughs> um okay so this is my new script i'm going to save it i'm going to put it inside the data folder and we're just going to write empty cars for it. Well, you, yeah, dot R. Okay, so if you go into the data folder, you'll see this new script that didn't exist before. And up here in your Git tab, you have. Um, Git has noticed that there's a new directory, and it's like something's in there. So if you click um, staged, it'll notice that, it, that there is a script that's been added. So um, let's go ahead and commit it. Um, created for um, a purpose. And then commit, close, but don't uh, push it yet. We're gonna we're gonna now um, make a change to the. Uh, let's do links and cars. And you notice when I change, I think I pointed this out last week, um, that when you make a change to this, this turns red and it has a star on it, meaning like you've made a change but you haven't saved it. And you notice at this point, Git hasn't seen any change yet. Um, because you haven't saved any changes. So once I save this, Git's going to be like, ah, I see you changed this. And you can see that status as an M because it means a modified. So then let's go ahead and stage and commit that change. And you can see that I added a line to an existing, like since the last commit, this is the, the, the new change. Um, as, as you work on projects with other, like if, if there are other folks at your um, agency that you're working with on projects, commit messages tend to be like a, a culture and 
there are even spec uh, specifications around capitalization and like what verb tense you use. So um, I yeah. think a good recommendation is just to be very clear about what has been added. So for example, maybe um, Janelle would say added length MT cars. And you don't need to commit for every line of code, but every time you make a major change, like um, I added new counties to the map. Okay, I'm I'm going to um, stage that change and then commit it with a message, added new counties to map. So that if I realize later, oh man, I added the wrong counties and I have to go back and um, and kind of like pick up from before that point, I know exactly where I made that mistake and I can go back and fix it. Um, a lot of uh, new developer new developers will make commit messages like changed a thing and you're like great that's yeah. not good. it's never gonna help <laughs> yeah exactly yeah that's a good point i always i always like to also mention like why i'm making the change so that because sometimes like i can look at the code and tell what i did but um I, I can't always remember why I did it, you know? Um, so I try, sometimes I try to, to do those things and I don't know if that's the recommended way or not, <laughs> but like, that's just my, my way I've been working. Like, and when you start working, like, and you're just working kind of by yourself and not with others, you don't really pick up on like these culture nuances about how your commit messages should be. <laughs> so I'm sure Carolyn and I will figure it out a good way. Oh, good. Yes, thanks, Jason. Okay, so, so we have two commits ahead of the remote branch. Um, and so you could keep like adding and adding and you can rack up more commits. And then um, at the end of the day or before you go to lunch or whatever, um, push those. And then again, you see those changes on remote. And then you can see this directory and the, um, the script that you created. So a cool thing on GitHub, I'm sure other um, platforms have the same thing. You can um, see what all your commit messages were in order. And then if you like click on one, you can see like what exactly was done for that particular change. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think I wanted to. Uh, oh yeah, I wanted to talk about the README as well. So. Um, so if you notice, this says README.md, and then it just says like the name of the repo really big and that's all it says so something that's really cool is that if you open this readme.md and this is just a markdown file so it's not an r markdown file it's just a markdown file um you can change this And um, it will react, and then you're, you, it's kind of you can use it as your like sort of homepage for that repository. Um, so if I were to, so like this is a header one when you just do one um, pound sign. Uh, so you can have a header two and a header three um, and just text about test. Um, and then you can preview that and then, you know, fix it up if you don't like it very much. And then you can, um, you can commit and push that and it'll show, I'm just going to sort of barrel through this real quick because I just want to show you how it reacts. Um, I'm going to push that. And I don't want it to do anything with the HTML. So honestly, what I would do if I had more time is go into the git ignore and add 
Well, actually, maybe I'll just do that. I'm gonna go to the end, get ignore and just do, I don't want any HTML going out to, to GitHub. So if I change that um, and save it, wait, why didn't it, wouldn't it like not see this anymore? Well, uh, do you know why it's not seeing it? I mean, why, why it's seeing this, Carolyn? I don't know. I was reviewing the questions. I didn't see what. Um... Okay. So I added, I added star.html to mm -hmm. get ignore because okay. I don't want this to, I don't want the HTML out there. Okay. Um, but it didn't let it like, go away. But any, anyway, my okay. point was just going to be, that this readme reacts to you know what you did um, in the readme.md, and so you can control like how this shows up. But anyway, you see what I'm saying? Oh, oh, now it does. I guess it just needed it needed a second um, to recognize this or something. I don't know. But that's so before the Git tab was seeing the HTML file, and now it's not because I added this star.html. Um, and so now it's like well, we notice you changed the Git ignore file. And so the reason I'm, I feel it's really important to talk about the git ignore file is because as HMIS admins, we do not want our HMIS data out on GitHub or on GitLab or whatever it is. So what you're probably going to want to do is um, is modify your, your git ignore file to where you're not seeing anything in the data um, directory, say, as an example, um, because we actually had a script in the data, <laughs> in the data directory, but, um, anyway, um, if you, you can indicate these kinds of things in this way, and so if you wanted, say, um, you wanted it to only ignore CSVs that were in the data folder, you could do star.csv, and now anything that's in the data folder that's a CSV will be ignored by Git, right? So you want to arrange this file such that you're not pushing HMIS data out to your remote branch. So and that's why I wanted to cover that. Um, so I wanted to get to real quick. Um, I wanted to. Um, so we, we created a repo and then we cloned it into our studio, but I want to also um, have people clone the R training repo and create and the R training project on your local machine. So um, where is that link? It is in the chat. At, it says yep. home can be found here. Yep, I got it. I will put okay. it back in the chat. So, yeah, you want to go to github.com slash, oh, dang it. It's in the chat now. It says repo at the bottom. Yeah, thanks. So if you go here and do clone and then click the um, clipboard, and then go over to our studio and do file, new project, same thing as before, version control, git, paste, and create project. But I'm not going to do it because it's going to error out because I already have an R training project. Um, but so once you get here and it, this looks like this, you can go ahead and click create project. And then the really cool thing is that you will have the whole repo um, back to week one um, as to all, you'll have all the scripts that we use in week one. You'll have everything that is available in the R training uh, repository. And it should look like this when you get it in. And you can you will have all the scripts in your R Studio to play with. And then, um, 
Yeah, and, and that, that goes for any repo that um, me or Carolyn or any of the other folks that um, are an HMIS admin that use R and that are sharing their code on GitHub. Um, this is the way that we can actually like share our data. I mean, our, not our data, God, what am I saying? This is the way we can actually share our code, right? So you just all pulled down, hopefully, the um, our training repo and you have it now on your local computer. The R community is pretty, um, I feel like most developers I've met working on projects are happy to share their code and um, happy to, to see others benefit from that. Um, I, I think it's horrifying and embarrassing to share my code, but Janelle's been really, <laughs> uh, that's, we set up the Cohio kind of um, shared, like she and I both work on the Cohio um, what is that called? It's yeah, not actually, a, I, like a yeah, I was just going to discover that because there's, so GitHub at least, I'm sure other platforms have similar things, but GitHub has what's called organizations. And, the, you know, this has always been my GitHub page since even before I really was coding for reels. And um, I was just like sharing code under that name and it was just weird because us like nobody knows me by that. Um, so I, you know, in talking to people at Ohio, figured out that there's this uh, organizations feature in uh, GitHub. And so I created this, um, this organization and then you can have teams and you can have people and there's me and Carolyn. And um, you can also have projects here so projects is a really cool feature um and and you know anybody can come here and see some of these I, the ones that are public you can see um so like and this is like a kanban thing um or it, it like defaults to having like a to do and an in progress and a done and then i added like waiting on something and so when you're um when you're done with a thing or let's say we figured out actually i didn't do that yet you can move these cards around um, and you can see the colors here change so like all these greens are in the done pile and then this the purple is just like waiting on something and if it's gray it's still to do so if i drag it over to here um you know it's like satisfying kind of you know <laughs> um and so like these are, you know, just a good, like, good way to see like where you're at on things and to share uh, responsibilities in, in uh, things like this. They also have projects. So this is a project at the organization level. They also have projects at the repository level, which I'm not using. But like if I come here, this is like my biggest, my busiest repo that I ever work on. And they have projects here. Um, too, but I just, I keep all the projects up at the Ohio level. I don't know why. You can also have issues, um, so people can enter issues for it um, if they're having a problem with your code. Um, and so, and it's it's actually pretty, uh, like if you wanna put in a bug report, they have this like template thing, it's like, you know, and ex encouraging people to like reproduce the problem and put screenshots and like, so yeah, I don't know, it, they've, they've really thought this out. Um, so, and then another feature is like an insights, you can go to the like network thing. Um, and I only have one branch, but anyway, uh, this is sort of all how it works. And the really the cool thing about it is how the commits are, you know, you can see um, all the commit messages that um, I understand, but anyway. So I'm gonna get back to the slide. I, is there anything else in the, that I should demo, Carolyn? Or any questions I should answer? I don't see any new questions and I feel like we're, I think we covered the basics. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, back to the uh, slide then. And you could run these slides too if you have um, installed the, the packages needed for that um, now that you have that repo on your computer. So uh, the homework is to, I know some 
some folks have tried to install the tidyverse and had trouble and um but so if you could just get the tidyverse um installed then that would save us some time um if you do have trouble i recommend like whatever it sort of comes back at you about try to install that package on its own um like just separately from the tidyverse so the tidyverse is kind of like a pack of packages <laughs> Um, and so installing the tidyverse installs a bunch of other packages um, that work well together. Uh, so then the um, the other second second part of it is to um, in the tutorial tab to um, I think in the first the the homework for week two was to do the data basics tutorial. Um, so the other the next one that I want y'all to work on is the the filter observations, and um, this actually will introduce some tidyverse concepts that we haven't talked about yet, um, and then we'll go over them um, next week as well. Um, I don't know what that's for. And then the um, last part of the homework is to um, in the in the project that we called practice. Uh, so the last week we created a project called Practice. Um, create a uh, a directory in the um, in the root directory of that project called Data, and then if you can get your HUD CSV export from your HMIS and save it to the that new directory, and then if you need to unzip it into that same directory. So um, it'll look kind of like this um these like all of these kinds of things it'll look like that um and then next week we will um we will go over tidyverse and we will be able to use you'll be able to use your own hmis data to learn uh like tidyverse concepts um, which is going to be a lot more exciting than week one <laughs> um, because you'll actually be doing things that kind of mean something um, and it'll be it'll be a lot uh, cooler. So um, I think I think that's it. I think I skipped this one if if you are so inclined. I did change the the donate link to the Cohio, changed it from the pandemic fund to Cohio um, proper because the pandemic fund link is no longer uh, good. So just in case um, that is something you're interested in. And then we'll talk to you next week if there aren't any, any other questions. You got anything, Carolyn? Um, I don't see any written questions, but um, maybe if folks would like to use the audio, uh, you can raise your hand. I can unmute. Oh, yeah. Wait a couple minutes. Nice. Okay. It seems like it seems like everybody's good. Great. Well, thanks, Carolyn. I appreciate it, and thanks everybody for turning out. And we'll see you next week. See ya.